Good morning. Before we get into the lesson, I first want to thank God for yesterday, the family breakfast that a lot of people here participated in, in helping uh, serve and facilitate, and also those that attended that time that are here with us this morning. Um, I thank God that you are here, and I just want to say that that is a special and good thing for us to be able to serve one another and invite, invite people from our community to come together and to experience the love of God. That is just a very good thing. It was very successful, and that's something I hope we continue to do together for a long, long time. Years ago, I was a counselor at a Bible camp, Midnight and Sun Bible camp here in Alaska, and I had fifth graders, if I believe that year, in my cabin. And around the campfire, we were sitting there, I think our first night together, and one of my fifth grade um, boys, I don't know why he had it, but he had one of those foot pumps for like a boat, like an inflatable foot pump um, in, inflator things. And uh, he brought it over near the fire, and before I could really say or do anything, he said, Mr. Mike, watch this. And he takes that, uh, the hose of it, and he shoves it up his nose, and he opens up his mouth and starts pumping it and blowing on the fire through the pump. And just like, tweaking, tweaking, tweaking. The air's blowing through his nasal cavities, out of his mouth, through this boat pump. And I was watching him do it for a handful of pumps. I'm just thinking, the, 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 the future of the generations of our people is bright. <laughs> that same boy... I think maybe the same night or the next night, had for some reason the inclination to take his deodorant and throw it in the fire that night. And I was like, no, like for several reasons. No, don't, that was not, that was not good. And uh, the smoke from that, um, from that deodorant, it was like the white deodorant, not like the gel deodorant. And that white deodorant, unknown to me, has aluminum in it. And so the smoke from that got in my eyes, because I was taller than everybody, and uh, got in my eyes. And you know that feeling of your eyes stinging from smoke? Well, that started happening, and it wasn't going away. And I ended up getting all these like al aluminum shards in my eye from that. And I had to go up to the Hilton, which is the big building there on the campgrounds, wash all my eyes out, and why did I have all this aluminum there? I'm like, oh my goodness. And just the pain on my eye was a lot from that. Well, a few years later, I'm at a different camping retreat um, with, like, with um, college-age students, and, and I'm, I'm in my mid-20s at that point, and I wake up one morning, and I have this like black like spot in the middle of my eye. I'm like, oh, I have something in my eye. I start, I start wiping my eye and, and washing my eye out. I'm thinking of the aluminum I used to ha I had in there years later, and I start wiping and cleaning my eye and nothing's getting rid of this spot and all morning I'm trying to do that and we had different sessions and classes um, and singing sessions together it was a Christian retreat and uh, I'm in the back of the room as the teacher is, is at that time is teaching I'm in the back of the room just like trying to figure out what is wrong with my eye so I'm in the back just kind of doing this because everywhere I look there's this black spot and I never experienced anything like that and when it was was I developed this like protein floater is what it's called where this little black spot is in the inside my eye and so everywhere I look I see it to this day I have this black spot right in the middle of everywhere I look but the speaker came up to me afterwards he's like are you okay because as I'm speaking I'm I see you in the back it looks like you're having like a vision or something because you're seeing things nobody else can see as you're up there in the back doing this you know, so I gave him a good scare from that unintentionally. But I, as I'm talking to you right now, I see this spot in my eye. And it's everywhere I look, just to the left, there's this spot. And I, I was 24, 25 when that first developed. And it was then I realized um, that this body is not going to last forever. Like I always knew that to be true, but this is my, it was, that was like my first 
uh, reminder of, of an expiration date of these physical bodies that we have now are not always going to be with us. They're, they are, they're going to break down. Our check engine lights are going to come on and things are going to wear out. So I say that we're going to come back to this in a moment, but I tell you this story to remind us that we are all in need of healing. One way or another, eventually, we are all in desperate need of healing. If you haven't been here these last few weeks, we've been going through the Gospel of John and going through a series of there's these seven miraculous signs that are shown in the Gospel of John intentionally for us to understand Jesus and to then believe in him that we may have eternal life. And this is our third sign today that we're going to be looking at. We've already talked about the wedding at Cana where Jesus turns the water into wine. We talked about how Jesus healed an official son from a distance and all that that entails. And so today, our third sign, which is going to be in John chapter 5, if you want to have your Bibles and open up there, we're going to see where it is a healing that takes place at the pool of Bethesda. So the title of this lesson is the title today. And we're going to see how this is a powerful sign that Jesus displays pointing to the only feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. This helps set the scene for this sign that this feast that's going on, we don't know what exact major feast this was, but it's probably Passover. But the important point is that then see in verse 2 that now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which uh, facts about the pool of Bethesda is that Bethesda is a word that means house of, of healing. And the the archaeology and the the architecture of this pool they just a few decades ago in Jerusalem they found these ginormous uh, pools and these five colonnades that are surrounding them uh, we see it's like a, a large rectangle depicted here in our in this uh, picture and we're going to see in our next verse that there are multitudes of people surrounding and, 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 um, uh, and injured people all congregate around these pools as we see here in verse 3. They lay multitudes of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. So just as we're getting into the sign that's about to be taking place in Scripture, invalid uh, surrounding this, this place. Now, You are probably familiar that uh, I typically use the English Standard Version uh, of the Bible. And and I need to take a moment to explain how, if you're using the ESV, that verse 4 is not in your Bibles. If you're using the King James Version um, or several other versions, uh, newer translations tend to not have verse 4. It'll go John 1, 2, 3, 5. And uh, that's nor- not how normal numbers work. There's, so it's skipping something. There'll be a footnote talking about where verse 4 is. And I, w- I would like to um, speak to that, just why that is the case. So in the oldest manuscripts, the oldest copies that we have of the New Testament, uh, verse 4 is not included in the, in the oldest manuscripts. Uh, and the ones that came a, a couple hundred years after uh, that is when the what we call verse 4 starts showing up. And I'm going to show what verse 4 uh, is here in a moment. And what it was probably was a, it was probably a, a note, uh, a scribal note to the side explaining um, some more uh, historical context to the situation that we're reading about. And that was, and as it was written on the side for the, the scribes to understand or readers to understand it over a couple centuries instead of being written off to the side was just written into the middle of, of the text but it has no um, overall theological implications um, but it does uh, there is a textual variant of sorts so here's what verse 4 says uh, for an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred the waters Whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was healed of whatever disease um, he had. So what's important about this, regardless, is that the people surrounding the pool 
believed this. And whether or not an angel actually would routinely descend to stir up the pool and to cause this healing is a great conversation for us to have another time. But what's important for this, uh, this sign, this setting, this scenario, is that the people in this setting really believed an angel would occasionally come down and that there was healing that could be uh, had by entering the first person to enter into the pool. So verse 5 that says that there was one man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. There was a man probably been at this pool for for 38 years. He's had something where he can't function in society. He can't he can't move he, he, or he can't walk really. He is he's crippled for 38 Years. I can't imagine the pain and the loneliness, the suffering of this man. That's, that's longer than I've been alive. I'm 34, so I'm at 38 years this man was, uh, was burdened with this condition. And, you know, my protein floater in my eye is, like, so laughable to 38 years of, of this, um, this crippled man and I start to connect some dots and just think of, you know, just knowing people in the community and people in my family and, and just the pain I see with, with people who have, have endured for so long with, with chronic pain and conditions and just the, the anxiety, the, de- the, the depression, the concern, just the, the weight from that, those illnesses can be so crushing. I've just seen it. Uh, I, I've, you and I have conversed about it. We've prayed about it together. And I know that the, 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 this is a, a real struggle of humanity of having illnesses like this. And this is nothing new. This is something we see here. And I, and I wonder, let's just say hypothetically, this pool does occasionally get stirred up and the first person in gets healed. If you went down into this pool right now, what would be healed? You know, think about, just put ourselves in this setting. If you went in, if, if I went in my eyes, like, oh, now the black spot's gone. Um, if, we're gonna, if I was to do that, what do you think everyone else at that pool would think about me? It's like, why did you get in for your eye? This guy's been in here for 38 years. And why did you go in? And we're going to see how the tension of that is actually an issue that goes on. But put yourself in this place. If you were to go in, what would, uh, what would you be healed by? Now, verse 6 says, When Jesus saw him, this man of 38 years that's there, lying there and knew that he had already been there for a long time. And I, I'm so moved by this verse as we see that Jesus, he saw him and he knew this guy had been there for a long time. And I want to tell you now, likewise, Jesus knows exactly what you're going through. Jesus, Jesus knows exactly how long you've been burdened. One of my favorite verses is Psalm 56, verse 8. It's a verse that's helped me through so many things. And it, it says that, that, G, that God keeps count of your tossing, that he keeps your tears in a bottle, and they are recorded in his book. And it's this, this knowledge for us to have that God is completely aware of all of the suffering you, you experience. And he has a tenderness towards us to understand every single thing that we're... He knows what we're going through better than we know what we're going through. And that he has that awareness that he's not just all-powerful and far-removed, but he is completely aware of exactly what you're going through. And then and he also is willing to do something about it. He tells this man, he said to them, he says to him such an interesting question. He says, do you want to be healed? And I'm an often sarcastic person. I read this. I'm like, what a a rhetorical question. He's been here for 38 years probably. Do you want to be healed? And And it's an important question to ask. 
And, it's, and Jesus asks it not just flippantly, but it brings up everything going on. That this guy is at the pool for a reason. And he's been suffering with this for a long time. But it's, it's bringing up the reality is something is broken and, ne- and, and needs to be fixed. But do you want it to be fixed? And for this man to be thinking through these things, do you want to be healed? It's important to understand our plight and understand his mercy and power. I think of Mark 2, 17, where Jesus teaches that it's not, it's not the healthy that need a physician, it's the sick. And he says, yeah, I came to heal the sick, not the healthy. I came to call the unrighteous, not the righteous. And the, here, here's the thing. Without Jesus, nobody is healthy. With, without him, no one is right. And so if you think that you're right without Jesus, if you don't think you need healing, you're not going to go to the healer. And this man, him asking this man, do you want to be healed? Him recognizing he is in need of healing. Well, good news, no pun intended. There is a healer. There is a solution. I think of Matthew 5 on the Sermon on the Mount, the beginning where Jesus, the first thing Jesus says is, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And this recognition of, I don't have enough. I'm not going to make it as I am. I am poor spirit. I am spiritually and physically bankrupt. I wasn't planning on saying this, this especially this way, but it's true. We're all going to die. It's not something I was planning. It sounds kind of crazy. We're all going to die. But it's true. Unless Christ comes down before our lifespan you know, happens, um, these bodies have an expiration date, and it's going to happen. We are, all, need of, we are all, all in need of spiritual and physical healing. We're not going to make it on our own. We're in need of a savior and a healer and a creator to recreate. And unless you recognize, I want to be healed, I am in need of healing. If you don't have a need of a savior, then Jesus isn't for you. So we need to recognize we need to be healed. So this man says to him, verse 7, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going down, another steps in. This man is working with what he knows. He doesn't know who he's talking to right now. He doesn't recognize Jesus is the Son of God and and the Almighty. And his response of, do you want to be healed... He's at the pool because he thinks this is where he can get healed. He's trying to get healed through the methods in which he understands and which he knows. And I almost see this like a, uh, either certainly the potential, if not the hint of like a bitterness of, I have no one else to go to help me get in. And every time I try to get in, somebody else goes there. You can see like a pointing of a finger. Like I want to be healed, but it's that person's fault that I'm not. Is these people that are not allowing me to get healed. And I see that spirit sometimes rising up in me. And I see in the world where it's like it's their fault I'm this way. And, the, and we start casting the blame towards others maybe even to a degree rightly so, of I'm this way because of these people. And, but that, that only is there because you're, this, this man is operating off of only what he sees and only what he's been told of in his environment, in his traditions, in his culture, in his circumstances. He's leaning on his own understanding and he does not understand who is asking him these questions. And because of that un- misunderstanding, that, that, um, that ignorance, there is now beginning a source of bitterness. But we see now, in this next verse, things begin to change gears. Jesus tells him, get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once, I love that, at once, he was healed. 
he took up his bed and walked. And he did it in a multitude. There's thousands of people here probably. Hundreds at the very least. Who, this, guy's, this guy's the, he's the, the longest running member of the pool club probably. Okay. And, he, and I just can't imagine being someone else on the cross of the pool and like thinking, oh, let's, call this, let's call this guy Nate. It's like, who's Nate talking to over there? And just watching them having a conversation. And then watching the guy who's been across the pool for you for who knows how long. He's been there at least for 38 years. He gets up. And he doesn't like hobble. There's no physical therapy that needs to take place. He's just up. And Jesus tells him, and, and go. He tells him to, to take up your bed, to get out of here. Leave, leave this place. And this is such a powerful sign because it shows that it's what Jesus says is. It's not about your culture. It's not about the traditions. It's not about your, uh, what you think is, is right. It comes down to what does Jesus say? And that he is the ultimate and only authority. And that healing doesn't come from some environmental process. It doesn't come from something that's just some sort of tradition um, or some sort of ritual, the only actual healing comes from the mouth of Christ. And what he says is. It just is. Whenever Christ says that he is that powerful, he just says, get up. Boom, he's up. That is the power of God. And that is the one we believe in. That is the one that we follow. And I love how Jesus' miracles so often are done publicly. It's not just something he experiences in a cave alone by himself, but it's something done for everyone to see and it's done to someone who everyone knows, Nate's been here 38 years. Now he's doing jumping jacks. Like that's just a profound public sign in a crowded, crowded place. So he says, take up your bed and, 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 and walk. And I, he doesn't have to live at the pool anymore. And I think that's an important point. His bed isn't there anymore. He doesn't live at the pool. And I think that is a challenge to us when we recognize that healing comes from Christ. You come into contact with Christ. When you get healed by Christ, you don't live where you used to live anymore. You, you set up shop somewhere else now. Your, your home is elsewhere. You don't need to go to where the world goes for healing you go to the only one who actually can provide healing, and you're with him always. And so you don't have to live where you used to live anymore. He's now given you the power to walk away from that. And I find that to be so freeing to, then, to, to be empowered by him to go and to walk away from the pool. So we now see the, the effects of this sign starting to have instant ramifications uh, this next verse we see, now the, the day was the Sabbath, and the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath, it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. So the Jews here are the, are the priests and the, and the Pharisees of um, Jerusalem, and they have this, this problem, they have this, this disconnect, and I, this is an important point to demonstrate, this is what can't think of a different word, lostness looks like. Where there's this powerful sign being done in their face and they're just missing it. They're concerned about this man carrying his bed on the Sabbath instead of the, the fact that, the, that, that Nate has not, is now walking now and he hasn't been able to for 38 years. We see that this the man, Nate, we're just... His name's not Nate. I'm just saying Nate. Uh, the man who healed me, they, but he answered them, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. They asked him, who is this man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? And it, it's subtle, but I want to point it out that, that Nate says, the man who healed me told me to do this. And the Jews, they don't acknowledge the healing. They don't just say, who, the man who healed you and, took up, and told you to take up your bed and walk. They, just, they only care about 
who told you you could do this? They're not giving any sort of acknowledgement this man can walk. And it's just this disconnect. It's like selective hearing where it's like some, you just don't want to hear something, so your brain doesn't even register that it has been said. I think of Christ's word, of he who has an ear, let him hear, and, and or having this a hard heart. And this is what lostness looks like when you are wanting to hang on to your frame work of, of thought, when you want to hang on to your own understanding, when you don't want to learn or to seek truth, you just want to keep what you have, then you are not able to receive an outside information. You're not able to learn, to be taught, to, to, to be able to be guided. You just want to keep what you have instead of receive what has been given. And this is what lostness looks like for you wanting to control and keep what you think is right instead of trying to understand what actually truth is. And truth is standing in their face. This man is walking to them, which could not have been done five minutes ago or 10 years ago or 38 years ago or well, 37 years ago, 38 years ago, maybe. We don't know. So we see then, verse 13, <clears throat> that the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in that place. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple, and Jesus said, See, you are well. Sin no more. That nothing worse may happen to you. When I first read this, I just thought, like, whoa, Jesus, like, way to be a buzzkill, kind of. This guy hasn't walked for 38 years and just like, good to see you. Sin no more than nothing else may happen to you. Worse. I was like, what? Cool. But we need, to, we need to slow down and think through what's actually being said here. And also uh, the significance of what is being, being taught here. And I wanna, I'll speak to that in a moment. But before that, th at, Jesus finds him at the temple. And as we, I showed you in that picture of the location of the pool of Bethesda, just next to the pool in that picture there is, is the temple mount. The temple is right adjacent to the pool of Bethesda. And so this man who's healed... I love that he goes right up to the temple, it seems, which is this awesome. When God heals you, you go to God. I just think that's a very natural and good thing. And so Christ finds him. Christ follows up with him. And that is a really great thing to understand, that Christ meets him. He finds him in the temple because he cares about you. He's going to find you, and he connects with him. And I think of this really moving analogy by C.S. Lewis about how we are all, he says, we're all living houses. And the concept is that if you're a, a, a house and you have something blatantly wrong with the house, like a huge hole in the roof, and he would equate that to some like obvious moral problem, like you have a, an addiction to, to pornography or to, to drugs or to something that, um, you know, is a, is and an, a quickly to understand moral problem and as as in need of help you call out to the savior lord save me from this and when by calling out to him he knocks on the door and he shows up and christ you know the physician the, the master builder he knocks on the door of this house and you invite him in and you let him in and he starts working on this roof that has a very obvious problem and then after he heals that, he fixes that, he then starts ripping up some of the flooring. He then starts knocking down some of the walls and adding on additions. And he's like, whoa, 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 like I didn't ask for that. I just wanted you to fix this one thing. And Christ says, well, I did need to fix that, but I'm not here just to fix that. I'm here to help change you to look like me, not just fix the things you specifically want fixed. I'm here to transform you into what I know you're supposed to be, which is supposed to be like me. And so Jesus heals this man's legs, but then he does something much more important. He says, sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. What's worse than being invalid for 38 years? Sin. 
Sin is worse than being crippled for 38 years. The things we wrestle with, with our bodies and our aches and our pains and our cancers and all of these, these things that we have to be burdened with physically are so, are so less than, being connect, than from being disconnected from God. That having sin in our lives is way worse than having the physical uh, crippling pains of disease. And, and that's such an important point that, that mercy and goodness from God is greater than we can even understand. And sin is more evil than we can understand. Both those things are equally true. And for this man to know he has been healed, uh, but don't sin. There's something worse than what he experienced in those 38 years. And he's been set free from both. You know, through that, that Christ can set him free from both. And the message is to, true to us today. He's going to set us free from these bodies and give us new bodies later that are perfect and awesome. And he's also going to save our souls to be with him forever. And, and to understand that is, a, that is a true gift from him to uh, us for those who, who desire it. Um, and also sin doesn't make you bad. Sin makes you dead. And to understand the, the gravity of that. So this man needs to understand salvation is right at hand and sin is way worse than we can imagine. So this man then went and told the Jews that it was Jesus who, again, he healed him, not just telling him he took up his bed to walk, but he points and gives credit rightly to Jesus. And I want to challenge us on this point that that, some, that Christ did something good for this man and he gave credit to Christ that is, it was him that did this to him. So I want to challenge you with a question I've asked you, I think, quite a few times over the years. If Christ has been good to you, say amen. amen. We need to be able to go to people and say it was Christ who has been good to us. If you've been healed of something, if you, whether it's physical things, I know some of you guys have gone through physical things, uh, and the Lord has led you through that. But if he's healed you from not just physical conditions, but if he's healed your mind of anxieties or depression or loneliness, if he's healed you and led you through valleys of the shadow of death and, and brought you into um, still waters and green meadows, if, he's, if he has brought to you good things that we be so quick to be able to tell someone it was him who healed me. And that is, that is not even something we have to think about. That is just a natural truth that we express so quickly to tell the world that there's a healer. Because I don't want people to be like me. I want people to get to know him. And for people to see that it's him who's doing the healing, not me just figuring everything out on my own. So you recognize the healing he's brought to your life and you be quick to be able to tell people who did the healing and who brought the healing into your world and who can bring the healing into theirs. But Jesus answered them, these, these people who are still bent out of shape about um, uh, Jesus' healing on the Sabbath. He says to them, my father is working until now and I am working. And Jesus is, is again challenging these, these scribes, these Pharisees, and I want to point out their problem and, and what a bad problem it is. They think they know what's right, and they're not able to even see the righteousness that is before them. And a reoccurring problem that is displayed with them that Jesus shows is Self-righteousness is far more dangerous than unrighteousness. When somebody thinks that they're in the right without Christ, that attitude is so much more dangerous and deadly than simply living rebelliously or living in a way that is, is sinful. Because if you, again, think that you don't need saving, 
then the Savior is not going to make sense. Jesus is not making sense to them because they think that they're righteous by making sure people don't pick up beds on the Sabbath. And they are patting them, they're too busy patting themselves on the back to be able to reach out and receive the things that are being extended to them. And it's that attitude of self-righteousness that makes them unable to hear and see what's standing right in front of them. So don't take that path of self-righteousness. Self-righteousness is way more deadly than unrighteousness. Someone once put it this way, that a, a preacher can be a lot closer to hell than a prostitute. And the, the, the concept of that is someone who's doing something they know is wrong can still make the choice eventually, like, okay, this is wrong. I shouldn't be living this way. I need to be going a different direction. Versus, the pers- versus someone who's convinced that they're right when they're wrong. You see, the most dangerous lie is the one you believe. And if someone buys into a lie, then uh, there's a deception, there's a lostness that ha- takes place uh, with that. We see here that my father is working until now and I am working. And this is important to see that Jesus is active and he's going to act. And another challenging question, do you want him to act in your life? And this is my concluding question. Do you want to be healed? As a question extended to you this very moment. If you want to be healed, say amen. amen. Our Lord is a healer. This world is messed up. I'm messed up. I am in need of healing. I desire his healing. I think that you do as well. Not what the world is offering not what culture is trying to provide, not what tradition says is right. I want healing that Christ provides. That's what I want. I think that's what you want as well. I'm always so moved by the truth of that everyone here is five seconds away from being closer to God than they've ever been before in their lives. That there's an invitation from the Lord every moment to draw closer to him to be filled with the Spirit, to be the people he's called us to be, to be healed. And that we're all five seconds away from being closer to him than ever before. And the invitation to be healed is available. So receive what he is offering. I encourage you to do so. Healing of the soul now and body definitely later. And to receive by choosing uh, him instead of what this world offers. All the self-help books, all of the different uh, financial peace that can be given, all the different political systems that can be conceived, all the different circumstances you can try to place yourself. There's certainly amount of wisdom like it, that we can have here in operating in this world. But if you're looking to actually be healed, to be truly healed, there's only one source of healing. It's not a pool that occasionally gets stirred up It's not anything or anyone else other than Jesus. And letting that be something we believe and then can share with a world that desperately needs to know this. So if you're not chosen today to be healed by Christ, um, to have your soul healed by him, and to receive a promise of physically being healed by him uh, at his return, If you've not made that choice today, we have a baptistry here where you can receive uh, forgiveness of sins by confessing him and repenting of your sins and to to be baptized into his name here. You can do that right now. Uh, It's not just a special offer today only. This is available to you right now. And at any moment, uh, you can choose to to receive the healing of our souls that he has been able to provide through himself. And if you have found yourself stuck, where you've, you've gotten lost, where you started hanging on to your own understanding, you want to let go of that now. You're five seconds away from just letting that go. He said, be free. And what he says is, so if you want it, it's freely available to you today. 
We want to be able to be a place here that that is challenged and invited and encouraged any chance and opportunity we get together. So if you would like to be healed and either start this journey with Christ by entering into a relationship with him through baptism, or if you would like to be healed by being prayed with and restored um, and recognizing a letting go of things that are holding you back, um, be free and come forward now while we stand and sing this next song.